first of all, you have to be able to look at an idea and decide, gosh, is that really a good idea or is it a bad idea? Have you ever had that problem? Have you ever looked at an idea and tried to evaluate, is this a good or a bad idea? Um, well, really, that's the wrong question. The right question is, is this an opportunity worth pursuing? Everybody has great ideas. And you can look at an idea and you say it's stupid, but somebody else will think, hey, that's a great idea. So that's the wrong question. The question is, is this an idea that I can make money off of? Is this an opportunity that if I invest all of these resources into, it'll pay off? And so that's one of the skills as an entrepreneur you need to develop. How, how do I understand the market that, that's potentially out there for this thing? Um, you need a whole raft of startup skills around how, how do you start, how do you manage, how do you finance a venture. You need to figure out how do I become an advocate for this product and, and really sell it because money is kind of the, that's the blood of an organization. If you run out of blood, you die. And in an organization, if you run out of money, you just can't function anymore. So selling product is really important. Um, many of you will need to figure out how do you bootstrap if you want to start a business. Because maybe you don't have a rich uncle, and maybe it's kind of hard to raise investor dollars and get them to risk their money on your uh, startup. And so you may need to figure out how you bootstrap and, and so forth. And certainly you need to figure out how do you talk to the right people to raise money. You need to figure out how you build a team, because rarely will a startup happen by one person alone. Usually it's going to be a team effort. Uh, there are a lot of topics that you need to understand as an entrepreneur, but knowledge acquisition is kind of one of these first things that you've got to deal with. There are a few programs that we can point you to. Here in the Marriott School, we have the Business Minor. How many of you are in the Business Minor right now? And that's probably why a lot of you have come to the lecture series, because this is a component in the Minor. Uh, that's a great way to add some knowledge and to pick up some of these things that would help you in a startup environment. We also have an entrepreneurship emphasis in our business management major. So if you haven't selected a major yet, or if you've selected entrepreneurship, <laughs> there's a deep dive you can take into the subject of how do I do a startup. The information systems major is actually a pretty good major for those who are tech-minded and startup-minded. We have a number of students there. I would say it's 10 or 15% of the students in that, in that major are sort of entrepreneurial information systems types. And there are some graduate programs. So any MBAs here? I kind of doubt it, but there might be one or two. Um, we have a, an emphasis, a major for the uh, MBAs in entrepreneurship as well. And as a center, we're always trying to do things to reach out to the students across campus and provide events like the Miller New Venture Challenge that Seth talked about, um, where we offer hundreds of thousands of dollars of prize money in our raft of competitions. In February of next year, we'll be doing a mobile app competition. So if mobile app is your thing, I've got money for you there. Um, last year, everybody who made it into the finals of the mobile app competition got some money. So that was kind of cool. Um, the big idea pitch is something that everybody in this class could participate in. All you have to do is figure out, how do I create an interesting pitch, 60 second pitch to the audience? And uh, th that really was a lot of fun last year when we went to it. So go to that kickoff on Thursday, and we'll talk about some of these competitions in detail. We also have other centers here in the Marriott School that have resources for students. Uh, the Global Management Center does a lot of uh, study abroad kinds of activities. They also do a lot of uh, uh, foreign language education. Uh, the Center for Economic Self-Reliance does a lot in the space of social entrepreneurship. They have a whole program, the Peary Social Entrepreneurship Program, dedicated to that. So, and there are lots of cool clubs. I need to change this slide because we now call it the Entrepreneurship Club, no longer the CEO Club. Uh, the Association for Information Systems Club, for those who are tech-minded. There are lots of clubs. Cocoa Heads, if you're into Apple development. Um, Venture Factory, if, if you're about creating products. Lots and lots of opportunities out there. So I hope you'll look around this semester and see what resources are available. And, you know, the winner of last year's Miller New Venture Challenge was an engineering student, well, and his team, who had the, the previous year sat through the competition saying, there's no way in a million years I could do that. 
and he went to the venture factory and he went to some of these opportunities available to engineering students and he got involved and all of a sudden here he is killing it not only at BYU but in the external competitions. Owlet Baby Monitors has just been on a real tear winning all kinds of money. I think they'll be very successful. That'll be fun to watch them as they grow. The next thing in entrepreneurship, mentoring is really an important element of entrepreneurship. People don't do things alone for the most part. I know that we all ridiculed President Obama when he said, you didn't build that. And I, I'm as guilty as the next guy on that one. Um, because that really is a, that, that's kind of not a great message. But I think what he meant to say was the right idea. You didn't build it alone, you had other people involved. Uh, there was support for you along the way. And that happens in entrepreneurship all the time. Yes, entrepreneurs build their own companies. It's not somebody else doing the work for them. They work really hard. They work really hard. If you want an easy job, don't be an entrepreneur. Entrepreneurs work really hard and they build stuff. But also, the role of mentors is huge. It's very important. And you'll find a lot of people who are willing to be mentors for you. They've been down this road. They know what buzz saws you're heading into. And they'll visit with you. We have a great mentoring program at the Rollins Center. If you go to getmentoring.com or stop by 470 Tanner Building where our offices are down on the south side, fourth floor here, uh, we can put you in touch with the right entrepreneurs. Now you need to do a little bit of work first. You need to do some homework, but we'll get you connected with the right people who will help you to be successful. So don't try to do it alone. And then there are all kinds of wonderful books that you can read that will help a lot. We love Nail It Then Scale It by Nathan Furr. Is that the one we're doing, Seth, this semester for book report? So you all get to read that one. Uh, Steve Blank has a great book called The Startup Owner's Manual. Great material on, on how to be a smart entrepreneur. Um, as, as I read, as I got exposed to this material when Nathan Furr joined our faculty, uh, I and the other faculty who I was sitting with, we were all uh, nodding to each other saying, oh yeah, we've gone through that mistaken path many times. And the material you read in these books, Nail It Then Scale It, Startup Owner's Manual, Business Model Generation, um, these principles are true principles as we see the world. We totally resonate with this. So, and we have a great library down in 470 if you want to get other books on entrepreneurship. But there's no excuse for spending millions of dollars on product development without knowing that you've got a good market for that. That's the old style of doing entrepreneurship. Let me go raise a million bucks or three million bucks or whatever, and I'll build this thing that I have a vision for, and then I'll go sell it. That's not the way we do it. We've got to develop the market and the customer first and do this agile approach to uh, product development. And some of these books and other resources can teach you about that process that really works. Okay, and there's more. Um, let me just say one thing about this slide down near the bottom. Tech entrepreneurship, if you're gonna be a tech entrepreneur, you either need to be good at technology, either be a geek, or you gotta know a good geek who's willing to talk to you and help you navigate this space. You either need to have that technology skill or you need to partner with somebody who's great at that and you bring a complementary skill set. So, okay. Now, let me dig into the three fundamental principles that I told you would kind of be core here. You will see these over and over again if you analyze tech startups. So the first one is network effect. We sometimes call this one Metcalfe's Law. It's a, it's a principle that drives standards in the technology world. The second is principles of disruptive innovation. And the third one is Moore's Law or exponential technology growth. So let's talk about a few of these. So, a network effect is something that happens when a product becomes more valuable as people use it. So let's think about this for a second. We just invent the telephone. We've got one telephone. How much good does one telephone do us? What's the value of a single telephone? Probably kind of low, right? You can't do anything with it other than brag about, hey, I invented a telephone, look, see? But now if I create two telephones, I can talk to somebody else at a far distance, and now I've got some significant value created there. And as more people join this telephone network, I can talk to more people. So the overall value of that network has gone up. Okay, World Wide Web. 
This experienced a great technology uh, network effect. Um, so the World Wide Web, if just one company has a website, uh, there's not a lot of value to that. I mean, yeah, you can read about that company, but not a ton of value. But now if almost everybody has a website, you have one resource you can go to and you can access information about all of those companies out there. Now, the key is you didn't have to spend any more on your telephone or your website or your, uh, you know, plug in the technology that's experiencing this effect. You didn't have to spend any more. Your value went up because other people joined the network. That's the, the main idea of a network effect. We can illustrate it this way. Um, the value of a network increases in proportion to the square of the number of users. Yeah, I am a college professor. There's your formula, n squared. Okay, the value of the network is proportional to n squared. Um, if that happens, then you have a network effect. So, uh, let's talk through this just a little bit. It takes a lot of money initially to build the network, but then to add one person just takes a little bit of money. That's a condition that sets up a network effect. So think about uh, when, when Provo did the iProvo initiative and decided we're gonna put fiber in Provo and take it to all the homes in the city. Uh, you gotta dig up roads, you gotta put wire, uh, fiber optics on telephone poles, you've gotta go <laughs> run things to houses, all kinds of things like that. That's a lot of money. But let's say somebody builds a home and says, hey, I wanna connect to iProvo, or now Google Fiber, who just took over iProvo. I wanna connect to Google, Google Fiber. What's the cost of one home connecting to Google Fiber? It's gonna be a few hundred bucks or some number like that. And they just tap into the existing infrastructure really easy. Okay, when that happens, what you get is a very rapid cycle to a winner takes all situation. So let's look at Apple's iPhone. How many of you have an iPhone? Okay, how many have an Android phone? How many have a Windows phone? Two, okay, that's the most I've had so far in one of these lectures. But I think that number will go up. I think they, uh, Windows phone has 3.7% market share. And I think there is room for a third provider. But you saw iPhone was the clear winner. Android was second here in this room, and then Windows Phone was a distant third. Okay, users like to buy iPhone, why? Because there are tons of apps for it, right? And developers like to write software for iPhone because lots of users buy on the iPhone. In fact, Steve Jobs, what he did really well, he taught people how to pay for stuff. Here's 99 cents, I'll buy a song. Here's 99 cents, I'll buy an app. Uh, that doesn't happen on Android. How many of you here have bought something on your iPhone? Okay, now, Android users out there, how many of you have bought something on your Android phone? Okay, that's a lot smaller number, see that? Steve Jobs taught people how to buy stuff. That was a really key co contribution of his platform. And so they quickly got into this uh, virtuous cycle of, hey, we keep on getting better iPhones, we get more users because there are more developers, more developers because there are more users, and um, winner takes all, essentially. Now, are there more Android phones out there than iPhones? Answer is yes, Android has more market share. But I think the thought leader is still uh, Apple. And so, and if you watch the, the uh, press conference today, it was pretty clear they're doing some cool, innovative stuff. And I love seeing Apple and Google fight it out here, because that just means our devices are gonna get better next year. And you know, you, you've watched Napoleon Dynamite, right? Okay, admit it, yeah, you've seen it. Uh, Kip, at the end of the movie, he's singing to La Fonda about how he loves her, how he really loves her, but then he says, but still, I love technology, always and forever. Yeah, that's, I love technology. <laughs> okay, I won't sing it to you right now. We'll uh, save that for another time. Okay, so, network effect is principle number one. If you can identify a way to create a network effect, you're gonna get into this winner-takes-all cycle. That's gonna help you a lot. Uh, second principle, disruptive innovation. A disruptive innovation displaces some, what we'd call an entrenched technology. Now, it isn't disruptive because it performs better. In fact, it performs worse, typically. What happens, though, is that you provide an overall better value. And because you're providing a better value, users flock eventually to that disruptive innovation. What you do with a disruptive innovation is you alter the basis on which you're competing. So let's talk about this. 
here's the main graph that I use to, to teach principles of disruptive innovation. Over time, the market demands increased performance. Now there's a high end and there's a low end to the performance that the market demands. But over time, the whole market gets sophisticated. So 30 years down the road or 10 technology generations down the road, the low end of the market is probably above the high end that it, it was at you know, 30 years ago or 10 generations ago or whatever it ends up being. Okay, so that's how demand in the market grows over time. But now here's how an individual product grows. A product grows faster than the market demands because companies are really competing hard. They want to add new features to bring in new users, and they want to get better market share, and they want to beat out everybody else. And so they work really hard to develop this technology. And the performance of a technology improves faster than the market demand. Now, actually, with Apple releasing two iPhones today, or announcing two iPhones today, you can pre-order the 5C on the 13th, and then I think you can order both of them on the 20th of the month. But did you have a question? Are they trying to disrupt themselves? Uh, no, I think it's, it's a pretty good, I think it's an interest, we'll have to think about this a little more and talk about it and see the implications really. But what, what you see now is you've got two technologies, one that's lower cost and one that's the same cost as always. The 5S will cost the same as the previous iPhone 5. Um, but what they're doing is they're recognizing that, hey, I, you know, we're growing so fast and that, that growth is expensive. Those, those sustaining developments that are really cool, like for example, the new 5S, it has a motion processor, a coprocessor in it, that's always gonna be watching the accelerometer and the gyroscope. And it's gonna be able to tell your app, are you walking, are you driving, are you sitting in a room? And so app developers can take advantage of that context, which is a really cool direction in technology. But anyway, let me not get ahead of myself. Let me finish this principle. They recognize they've got this expensive device, and so now they're introducing a low-cost device to satisfy that lower end of the market that can't go spend however many hundreds of dollars on a, the latest and greatest. Well, here's what happens with a disruptive innovation. Somebody comes up with this cool idea, and they say, hey, what if we did the following? And they start developing their technology. Now, when that technology is first introduced, look where it is on the graph. It's way below the low end of the market. I mean, maybe 50 years ago we would have thought that was cool and yeah, let's go buy it. But now, it's way below what the market is really demanding. And so we laugh at it and we say, well, huh, nothing going on there. Kind of a dumb idea. But as they develop it further, look where it is when, okay, right here when it crosses into the low end of the market, look where the sustaining technology is typically. It's way above the high end. And that difference is an opportunity. That's a value opportunity. I can spend a lot less on a technology that will just meet my needs. Or I can go get that Cadillac that's way above what I really require. And that's how a disruptive innovation competes. You've altered that basis. And typically what will happen when you're below the low end, what you do is you go attack an unserved or an underserved market. So maybe you're going to go to Mongolia and, and try to sell your battery-operated 5-inch black and white TV or solar powered or whatever it ends up being, where you know in the US that's not gonna find much of a market. Maybe you go to a place where they could use that sort of thing. Um, and then you, when, when it gets good enough, then you bring it to the bigger mainstream market. That happens all the time. Okay, now, so network effect, principles of disruptive innovation, two key principles. The third one is what we call Moore's Law. Now it's not really a law. There's not a natural law that says this. But uh, 1965, the year I was born, so do the math and you can figure out how old I am. Gordon Moore, who is the co-founder of Intel, who makes a lot of the chips that you use in your computers today, he observed that the number of transistors was doubling roughly every 24 months. And um, somebody else said, well, he said 18 to 24, but no, he really said 24. If you look at Wikipedia, the graph may be updated today, but this, this dotted line here is a log linear plot of actual Intel CPUs and the number of transistors on them. Um, and so you can see that his observation has held true for my entire lifetime. Um, and it continues today. If you look at the updated uh, graph, you'll see that, that Intel's progress continues roughly on this log linear plot, which means that 
um, well, log linear means that we're doubling as we go up instead of, um, instead of increasing linearly. Uh, let me try to explain, give you some intuition on this. Uh, there's a story told about the inventor of chess and the emperor of China. The emperor of China really was enthralled by that game of chess, and, and uh, he said, well, I love this game. You deserve whatever you want. You just ask what you want, and I'll, I'll get it for you. And the inventor of chess thought for a minute. He goes, hmm, I think I'd like just a grain of rice. What, a grain of rice? A grain of rice for the first square on the chessboard, two grains of rice for the second square on the chessboard, four grains for the third, and so on until we fill the board. Okay, so what was the outcome of that request? Do you think the emperor of China could grant the request? How many grains of rice would that be? Okay, there are eight rows and eight columns on a chessboard, so you have 64 squares. Now, if you double 64 times, you basically have two to the 64th minus one squares or uh, grains of rice. Now think about that for a second. Have you ever computed two to the 64th? Okay, I've computed two to the 32nd, and that turns out to be about four billion. Now multiply four billion by four billion, and you get two to the 64th. There's not that much rice in the whole world. Okay, um, so obviously he was, uh, that was a request that couldn't be fulfilled. Okay. We're now, how many years after the observation that Gordon Moore made? Nobody took me up on my offer to do the math. How many years? 48 years. Okay, how many doublings should we have seen in 48 years? 24. Okay, 2 to the 24th. What is that number? Okay, yeah, higher math. Say again? It's... Yeah. Almost 20 million, not quite 20 million, 16 point whatever million. Okay, so given, given that, then computers today ought to be 16 million times better than they were back in 1965. And if you look at what they flew to the moon on and you compare that to what you have on your smartphone, you realize, yeah, Moore's Law really is happening here. Whoops, what happened? Uh, okay. Um, now, this doesn't just happen, in, so, so transistors on a, on a computer, when you double the number of transistors on a machine, it can go faster, it can store more information, it's just more powerful in a lot of ways. But it doesn't just apply to transistors on chips, it also happens to all of our other kinds of, of uh, technology. The hard drive you can go to Costco and buy today is, it's growing faster than uh, doubling every 24 months. Um, I just would dream when I was a kid about having that much storage. But you can buy terabytes of storage now. The, how, let's figure out who owns the most storage. Anybody have a two terabyte hard drive? Okay, four? More than four? Okay, so four terabytes. We have several people who said they have a four terabyte hard, hard drive. Think about that. When I was uh, first getting into computing in high school, it was five megabyte hard drives, if you even had a hard drive. Okay, so five megabytes. And now a thumb drive is measured in gigabytes, a thousand times those things that I had in high school. And that's on a thumb drive that you can just carry around and plug in anywhere. It's amazing how our storage uh, capability has increased. It's also happened on the network. Your networks today are much faster. When I was in high school, we had these dial-up modems. You've seen, anybody here watch the uh, War Games movie? Um, it's really fake, by the way. Somebody who appreciates technology will say, well, I, that would never happen that way. But they had an acoustic modem, and the, uh, they would dial in uh, on this acoustic modem and control computers that uh, controlled nuclear devices. Anyway, when I was in high school, 300 bits per second. And now, do you know how fast your Ethernet is? Anybody here know they have a gigabit connection? Yeah, okay, so several of you have that. That's a billion bits per second. Okay, so that's grown faster than computing technology has grown. And uh, the connectivity has grown as well. Has anybody done internet on the freeway before while you're in the passenger seat? <laughs> of course. <laughs> okay, you can get the network almost anywhere these days. If you're willing to pay for a satellite connection, you can get it pretty much anywhere. 
even in the mountains. Um, and this all happens at a decreasing cost per unit. And so what happens here is this is happening in all of our technology. And in fact, it's been happening my entire life. So I know it's been happening for your entire life. We increase the speed and capacity and we lower the cost of our technology and so we can process information faster. And as we do that, we can rethink our operating procedures. We can innovate and we can come up with better uh, products. And we develop new goods and services too. We never thought of Google when I was a kid. That was not something that we could even think of. It wasn't possible to think of that. Um, but we, you know, people have thought of that today. We get this network effect that increases the demand. Users flock to our technology. And so we spend more money on that, and that lets us to increase the speed and capacity and lower the cost of our technology. And this keeps on happening. This virtuous cycle, if you think technology is good, this virtuous cycle keeps on happening over and over and over again. That's the world we live in. Technology has been changing rapidly for a lot of years, and now the same thing is happening in business. And you see businesses modify their processes just as quickly. Now, you are part of what we call the millennial generation. Um, and, and as we've evaluated what millennials look like and, and how they operate and what the world is that they're going into, here are some of my thoughts on what I think you need to be able to do in the current environment. Um, I don't think if you're going to have a long-term career, I don't think it's good enough just to go do your job. I think you need to be looking at, at how do I add value to the company? How do I help us as a company to compete better? How do I come up with ideas and introduce innovations that will really help my company grow <coughs> and progress? Uh, so if you're a tech person, you can't just be a technology guru and say, well, I'm going to program the things that they told me to program. Or if you're a salesperson, you can't just think about, okay, how do I go hit my numbers? I think you need to be thinking all the time about how do I add value and make this a more competitive company? Because then your managers will say, oh, this is a, this is a forward thinking, essential person on my team. Um, companies are, are competing very uh, ferociously and you need to be a part of that. Um, I think you also need to be thinking about how do I apply technology to problems where technology hasn't been applied yet. So uh, if you go to the Miller New Venture Challenge, you'll see uh, a half a dozen different ideas that maybe you hadn't thought of before on how do I apply technology to solve these problems. Um, I think that you need to be thinking creatively as much as you can and, and part of what's going to enable, enable you to do that is this bullet point, you've got to retool over and over and over again. I teach an iOS development class in the fall semester. Every year about this time, actually it's been October in the past, which is really irritating, but Apple will release a new version of iOS. And so what happens is all my students upgrade. And I'm in the middle of teaching last year's iOS when the new one is out. I have to retool and I have to, I have to do that over and over again. There was not such a thing as mobile development when I was in high school. And um, anybody remember the Palm Trio or other Palm devices? You know, that was the original cool mobile platform. And I can't hardly remember those days anymore. I mean, I do recall vaguely having a Trio 650 and loving it. But uh, it's nothing compared to what we have today. We have to retool over and over and over again. Um, and I think that you need to also manage your career so that you can maintain your quality of life. Uh, many people are saying that you might even have to invent your own job. The startup of you. Google that phrase and you'll find some articles where people are talking about, hey, you know, the millennials need to be able to figure out how to create their own jobs. Um, so I wouldn't just plan on going to work for IBM and being there for 30 years as a career. That just probably isn't going to happen in very many places. You might find an exception here or there, but I think you've got to be very creative about this. So our business environment is evolving very rapidly. We're seeing cloud computing is a big deal now. I lost my previous Google phone up in the Uintas hiking King's Peak. It fell out of my map pocket and I didn't see it at the time. It actually got returned this year uh, when I lost it last year and it still works beautifully. So it weathered the winter just fine. But I didn't worry about losing it. Why? Because of cloud computing. 
Google had synchronized my stuff to my accounts on, on the server, on the cloud, and I just bought a new phone, synchronized, and I was ready to go. It was a little painful having to buy a new phone, but um, when I compared my new phone to the old one, there was no, no comparison, really. I gave it to my son and said, hey, you use it. Um, which he loves because he hasn't had one. So, you know, low end, high end of the market. You know how that works, right? <laughs> there will come a day when you can buy a new car and that'll be a lot of fun. <laughs> but for now, a used car is just fine. It gets you there. Um, okay, uh, social network, of course, you're growing up in a world that's full of, of uh, not just these, but it's Instagram, it's uh, Pinterest, it's all of these other social plays. And people are coming up with new ways to do social things all the time. I believe that mobile devices are a game changer, and I mentioned uh, a little bit of this last point, context-aware apps. Apple now has a chip dedicated to computing some of your context so that it can do a better job of serving you. When you're driving or when you're walking, you have different needs than when you're sitting at your desk. And now the iPhone 5S can figure that out. Um, location awareness makes a huge difference. If, if my phone knows that I'm at Cougar Stadium waiting for an awesome Cougar route of Texas and a storm is approaching, it can tell me, hey, you know what? I know where you are and you need to think about something that's coming your way. I wonder if it sent a message to Texas. Anyway, just wondering. Um, okay, so in closing, watch for these principles and trends. Uh, Think about how you can innovate and how you can build. Get involved somehow. Don't just sit there and let things happen to you. Get involved and network and do something active. Be proactive. And the center, the Rollins Center for Entrepreneurship and Technology is here with a lot of resources to help. Uh, so our website, learnearnreturn.com or getmentoring.com, come and uh, get involved. Thank you very much for your attention today.